very good morning and all the best to you thank you dr lamba thank you for the kind words thank, thank you sir thank you sir now i request dr kanwalveer singh hinsa sir to share the achievements of department to the participants over to you sir uh thank you professor ravneet uh good morning to everyone um uh, on behalf of uh, csc department babanda singh bahadur engineering college i welcome once again our uh, uh, distinguished speaker of the webinar dr abhinav kal uh, professor in monash university australia dr kal is uh, really hard working dedicated and committed to his research and profession and uh, we have been in touch when uh, uh, he was here at uh, iit roopad uh, thanks sir for sparing uh, uh, time from your busiest uh, schedule which you had today also before this uh, dr tal was having his meeting and then was having another webinar so we are really thankful to you sir thank you for the kind invitation uh, thank you sir Uh, we are really delighted to have presence of such a distinguished person for uh, uh, our uh, BBS BC International Talks, for which uh, CSC Department faculty and staff they are really working hard for the success of such endeavors every time, and we are having a live interaction with internationally renowned uh, academicians and researchers. in fact uh, uh, academicians and students from all over uh, uh, across uh, india and uh, around the world we have got uh, uh, many replies also responses since we started this youtube channel and uh, it has been a great response and everyone has been anxiously waiting for uh, uh, the next event the next future event which is being uploaded on the youtube channel uh, we scheduled that and the facebook page of the college for this webinar we have got more than 300 registrations from india and abroad and also from uh, canada australia and us it is indeed a proud moment of all all of us here at pbs bc that everyone is becoming part of such mega events this event is being live streamed on youtube channel of the csc department and facebook page of the college today also so i request everyone to subscribe for the youtube channel to have in order to have more information about the future events and the uh, feedback form of the webinar will be floated by professor ravneet kaur at uh, near about 12 pm in the chat box of the google meet so all participants who fill this feedback form they will be awarded with e certificates i congratulate professor ravneet kaur the coordinator of this event and her team for uh, carrying out always the good work regarding acm student chapter activities and the events and motivating uh, the students always regarding uh, the csc department uh, our department was established in 1993 and now in the 27th year of its existence we have got near about uh, uh, like alumni from all over the world and uh, in btech csc we are having intake of 180 department is running currently program such as mtech csc bca bachelor of computer applications and bachelor of vocational course which is software development it is a matter of pride and privilege for us that btech csc program it has been again accredited for the fourth time this year by the national board of accreditation nb and uh, naturally this nb accreditation means uh, much in like our department college is maintaining standards in teaching research and academic excellence our college was the first even in whole university way back to have many courses and be accredited bbs bc and csc department uh, we are having mous with iit bombay iit roopad and iit madras for training and research programs for the students and the faculty spoken tutorial labs which were uh, uh, started in 
it became a flagship program and in which near about 1500 students so till this time they have been awarded with uh, certificates from iit bombay csc department computer science and engineering department is having state of the art research labs such as cisco lab internet of things labs machine vision lab and ius lab for doing various research tasks by students and the faculty department has carved the nike for uh, itself in establishing various uh, centers of excellence such as red hat, red hat academy at bbsbc at cisco have resulted in excellence placements and training opportunities for the students of cs and 16 just for the information 2020 pass out students we have got uh, placements of uh, students in infosys cognizant digivalet and cap germany and there are many more in fact it is a joy for all the faculty and the staff that there are many students with more than one job offers and in this uh, uh, covid phase this uh, these offer letters these joining letters make us smile also and our students also so without taking uh, much time i would uh, request our eminent uh, resource person and distinguished speaker of the day dr abhinav tal to share and enlighten with his talk titled research and advances in deep fake detection thank you very much thank you dr din sir thank you for sharing the updates of the department it's really heartening thank you such a difficult situation with uh, the you know the covid uh, 19 and tell this uh, Effort is going on. It's very really difficult to get sync everyone together, yes. and convene at a single time. But it's really good to see that we have over 50 uh, participants. And uh, yes, uh, thank, thank you, you Dr. Abhinita as well. Uh, thanks for the very kind introduction. And uh, now I will share my screen. And let's start. Okay. So currently, I am with uh, the Monash University here in Australia, where I am leading the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Group. So we are a group of researchers uh, who are investigating problems in computer vision, in audio analysis, in human-computer interaction, and particularly how we can add human-computer interaction and AI together into a more human-centered system, a system which can. assist a person a user better for more productivity efficiency and safety and also uh, i am on leave from the indian institute of technology at gopa it's not so far from you guys and uh, there uh, i'm with the department of computer science and engineering so the work which i will be discussing today is uh, in collaboration with my students and collaborators at both the universities and here is the outline of my talk so i would start my the discussion with the process of deepfake generation i understand that we have a wide uh, you know uh, audience so i'll start with the very basics of how deep learning is now so much prevalent how it is linked to the traditional image analysis and how we are able to generate deepfake videos and in the later part of my talk i will be talking about a technique which we have recently proposed for detection of deep fake videos so what is a deep fake let me move uh, to this view can you see this uh, video sir screen you need to present your screen i guess the screen is not being presented it's not being presented yes ah just a second i'm so much used to using zoom that Suddenly, the big word. That's fine. Um, so, uh, I'm saying I can't share my screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Just. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible. It's visible. Thank you. Okay, so I was talking about a video which I would like to show, which tells us what is deepfake. So, 
some of you would recognize this video. This is actually from a really old movie, uh, approximately 28 years old movie. And I'll just play the video. And then I will ask you know, if someone can spot if there is any manipulation and what is that manipulation. This is a very uh, popular sci-fi movie. Let me just play it. After this thing is like you take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in the bed and believe whatever you want. Can anyone figure out what is different in this video clip? And, and, any student who would have seen this movie Matrix, can anyone tell me what is different? That's fine. Uh, so the original actor is actually Ken Reeves. So we have his face has been changed with that of Will Smith. And essentially it seems you know, the quality of manipulation is so good that it seems to the user that you know, this is the real actor, but essentially the identity has been switched and this is another person who is, uh, you know, orating the same dialogue as uh, Keanu Reeves. Now, that, that's actually a fun example of the fake, but uh, given the power of, uh, you know, the recent generated techniques in neural network, it's possible to have really terrifying manipulations in videos. And as we go in my talk, I'll show some examples and why we really need to, you know, have systems which can detect these kind of big things. So let's start with the basics here, okay, how, how this whole comes into picture. So here on the left is a picture from uh, IIT Roper. Okay, this is one of the campuses. And on the right here, I have a map of what looks like as the edges, you know, the boundary information of the building which we have here. Now, this is actually a basic low-level information which is used in image processing. So if we can extract this kind of edge information, we can then have meaningful analysis of things such as what is the primary object which is there in an image. Right? For example, in this image, we have this board, and you, know, you can also see in the edges here that based on the edge formation, it is actually an insignia of the university. You can also figure out, okay, these look like, you know, pattern of some windows. Here is, you know, let's say the upper boundary of the building. And th this is the basic building. Now, here I have a synthetic example. Who are new to image processing? Simply assume of an image as a two-dimensional matrix. So if it's a two-dimensional matrix, let's say here is the index point, and each pixel in my image will give me a number, and that number will correspond to let's say how much of a white or how much of a black this particular pixel is, essentially the gray scale. Okay. Now to understand how we compute the edges, let's take this example. So this is an image. As you can see, the sides here are white. Right, the left and the right side. And in the center, I have a black pattern. And just at the boundary, you see that there's a transition from the white color to the black color. So you see shades of gray. Now let's take one line from here. Okay? Just the values which I find in one line. So the values here would be in the range of 0 to 255, let's say. Okay, what that means is that the value would actually zero would recommend mean that there is you know black coming here and two five five would mean there is white. It's a very standard way of saying well I have an image which is you know using a eight bit representation. So what I do is I take this line okay so I take all the pixels which are there in my matrix which is the image and I plot it. So when I plot it, let's say I get this. So as you can map it, if this is the line, and I would plot the pixel value, white values. So here are the white values. We can see the peak. And then we see a gradual transition happening here. That is where we see that you know the now the values are going down into a valley, and then gradually, you know, we have these dark values, you know, the close to zero. And then again, when we are around this region of the image, around 
this particular point here, we see that from the dark, we are actually moving towards the up part. Okay. So what agitation will be that we would like to compute the change which is happening in this function. Okay, so this is a function, right? A function, let's say, of I'll draw here. So function of x comma y, which gives me an intensity value at the location x comma y in my matrix. Okay. Now I want to understand that when I scroll through this line from left to right, what is the change happening? When I look at these regions, when you, you see this absolute change happening, I can actually compute the first order derivative, and that will give me these peaks, right? Now, when you get these extrema peaks, you can actually tell that, okay, I have found an area in my image, which is corresponding to an edge. Okay? Now, edge, as I was saying earlier, is a very basic building block of an image. And you'll see how this really basic discussion, simple steps would lead us to defect generation. Okay. Now, formally, what would that mean? We want to look at the change which is happening in an image. And when we want to analyze the change in a function, we can actually compute the derivative, right? So let's say if f was a continuous function, then the partial derivative of this function f with respect to x can be mentioned like this. You know, we have seen this in our elementary mathematics. But since images are, you know, as I was saying, it's a matrix. If it's a matrix, it would mean it's discrete values. I can actually approximate this partial derivative. That is the change which is happening, let's say, in the x direction as this, where I would say, well, you know, the partial derivative of the image f with respect to x, that is the change which is happening in the x direction, is approximated as the difference which I have at a location which is next to the pixel location which I have currently, essentially subtracting the values of the next pixel with that of the current pixel. If there is a considerable difference, if you get a high value, that would mean that there is a change happening, right? Now, what would that mean? Let's say here is an example image on the top of that of a tiger. And if I was to compute the partial derivative of this image with respect to x, and then further the partial derivative of this image with respect to y, I would actually get these two outputs. Okay, So this is the change which is happening in the image in the x direction. And this is the change which is happening in the image in the y direction. And since I said you know, we would like to approximate this partial derivatives, what I can do is I can simply have, let's say, this array. Okay, So this is, array is also referred to as a filter. When I can take this filter, and I would start applying it to each pixel. By applying, I mean, let's say this is, if this is the pixel location under consideration, when I take this to my image, so think of it this guy is, some of you would already know these really basics, but some of us are, are quite new. So let's say I take it to this point in my image. Okay, so I would apply this one cross two here, and I would take this pixel, and with this pixel, I would simply subtract the value which I have with this. Okay, so I would get a difference. So that would be the change which I have in the x direction, and that is the output. Okay, just the differences. Now on the other side. With the, with the computer difference of my pixel value, the value which is below it. Okay, so that would mean, let's say I was at this point in my image, then I would be subtracting the pixel value here with this. Okay, and that would give me the map. Okay, so so at the arrow would get. So the two changes. Okay, now let's complicate it a bit, but it's uh, not. I, I promise it's not scary enough. So this is the input image. Let's say here is a filter which I can use to compute the difference in the x direction. Now, earlier it was uh, 1 cross 2, and now I have a 3 cross 3 filter. So that would mean I have a pixel under consideration, and these are the neighborhood pixels. Similarly, I have this for the y direction, and here is a 3 cross 3 pixel for that. So what when I apply these two filters onto my image, it, it gives me the two information okay the first is the magnitude which i can compute by computing the square root and then you know uh, adding to the change in x and y and then uh, i also get the tan inverse okay so the tan inverse at each value which is essentially 
telling me the orientation at each pixel. So the orientation of the angle. Now, if the magnitude is greater than a certain threshold, we'll say it's an edge-like pixel, OK? Now, this part was mostly used in traditional image analysis. And some of you would have heard of this term called the you know, deep learning and neural networks. Now we'll connect these two. Let's say I was to take the all the pixels in my image, which had an edge-like pixel. Okay, and what I do is I flatten that matrix into an image. Okay, now some values in that flattened output would contain, let's say, simple values around the magnitude or of the Pixel. So that is the strength of the edge which I have at that location. Further, what we would like to do is we'd like to learn around that. And the most basic representation which we have from learning is called your perceptron. Okay. So early on in computer vision, we were only doing these kind of filters manually. And later on, we found out, okay, we can actually learn this. And that's how deep learning comes into the picture. Slowly we'll build on to that. So now get, next thing what I have here is a perceptron. Okay. Perceptron is essentially that here I have the input on the left. Now this input, guys, again is let's say the flattened edge map. Okay, so the edge map with the magnitude values at each pixel. Now what a perceptron does is it takes into input a feature vector and it will output to us in the very simple setting, a class, if you know my input feature is of a positive class or if it's of a negative class. Okay. Now for that, what we do is now this is the basics of machine learning coming in. We are saying, well, I would like to learn a system which, given some observations, these observations would be able to generate a result, let's say if it's a positive or a negative class and for that i would like to learn these weights okay these weights essentially tell me that for this edge map this was the example here for let's say the first pixel here okay what is the contribution of this pixel towards the final goal that if this Im input image is positive or negative okay so we are going to learn this and that's the learning process is called the training of a perceptron. So there are two steps here. So the first is that we would initialize the weights randomly. And then we would like to compute an error. OK, so that's the training error. Essentially, what that is, that here f of w is the function which we are trying to learn. w is the weights which are randomly initialized. x of i is the edge input. And y of i is the label which I would like to be predicted. OK, so I'm training a system to generate this label. So if early on this is not same as this, then this value would be high. And we would be summating it for n samples. That is the n images which I have in my data set. Now, this is the feed forward step. In What I'll do is if when I get this error, I would then back propagate this error to update the weights of my perceptron, wherein I would simply be actually computing the partial derivative of the error which I've done in the feed forward. And I would be updating this by with respect to the current weight of my current layer. OK, so this is feed forward is you input the image and you generate the label. Back propagation is you would update the weights, which enabled us to get to a particular label in the first instance during my feed forward. Now, this back propagation is, of course, based on gradient information. Right, and uh, the most common algorithm which is used for back propagation is based on the stochastic gradient descent. That is essentially you'd be computing the weights updates. That is, we take one training sample at a particular time, and then we use that during the weights update in that particular epoch. Okay, so that's simply a simple neural network which, given an input image, should be able to generate a output label. Okay. Now, see, if you look at the transition, what we have studied is we said an input image is a matrix. I can compute the partial derivatives in x and y direction to understand where the edge information is. Why do I need that information? Well, because it's a simple low level knowledge about the structure of the image, right? the content of the image. 
Now further, if I take that as an input, I can then learn a simple machine learning perceptron. What that does is, given an input image, OK, it would be learning the importance in terms of the weights of individual parts of that input image feature and mapping it onto an output. OK, the output could be, for example, let's say if this image contains a building or it contains a tree. Okay. Now, this perceptron came in the late uh, you know, uh, 1950s. That was the, when the concept was introduced. And now you know, we are in uh, 2020, right? And early on, we had uh, you know, the <clears throat> fully connected network that is actually shown here on the top here. You'll see that here is an input layer. Let's say the same feature which we had from the edges. And then we have multiple layers here where each is densely connected. So you see this dense connection. And at the end, we are actually, let's say, having a output using a sigmoid function, which can tell if it's a positive or a negative image. But what really changed is that when we have an input image, you know, there is a physical limit on to how much dimension I can have in the input layer. Now, if I were to take the whole image and let's say it's a, it's a small image, which is 640 into 480 uh, you know, pixels, then still this would mean that the neural network would be really large. You know, of course, it would be a factor of how many layers you have, right? So from there, researchers, especially uh, you know, it was from the work of Jan Lacun and others, they said, well, if we're given an image, we should actually learn the filters. OK, so rather than having a fully connected layer, which you take an input and map it to all the neurons in the next layer, what you should do is you should actually take the input image and you should have a convolution layer. Now, what is the convolution layer? You can think of your convolution layer as a set of, you can think of this part, OK? You can think of it as a set of filters. So I showed you some filters, right? So I showed you a filter which was something of this type, which was minus 1 and 1. Then there was another one which was, you know, minus one and one and so forth, right? We can have multi-dimension uh, you know, filters as well. So instead of me having these weights where I said, well, you know, I would like to subtract to compute the edge, I would like to learn these weights based on the property of the images. Okay, so I would like to have a set of filters, you know, which would be applied to an image and that would extract information from the image. Okay, so what the information extraction would be based on convolution. Okay, that is convolving an image with this set of filters. And during the training process, we would be learning the filter weights. Okay, so this is different from traditional uh, image analysis where we would have fixed weights. Okay, so once you have the input image, you would apply the convolution using a filter weight, you would get a feature map. This feature map essentially, let's say, is showing at the very start, the basic edges which I have in my input image. Okay. Now, further on, as we would have be having a set of filters, we will get a series of maps here. Okay. Now, when you have a series of maps, these will have different types of information, different levels of information from the input image. And what I will do is then I will input this set of activation maps to another layer in my network, and that would extract even higher level information. Okay, so what that means, let's say, is let's see in this context, you have an input image here, and let's say I have this filter. So this is showing me a filter, and when I would apply this filter onto the input image, then I'll see this particular output. Okay, so this is the output which tells me that what is the confidence of this particular filter being in this particular location, right? How is the shape which we had in the filter? How is it shown? Okay, now let's have another filter. So I can walk the second filter which is now this, the earlier filter being rotated by 45 degrees, and I get this output. Now, if you notice, that these are very similar, OK? But if you notice very closely, for example, the top part of the building, this part of the building, you'll see that in this output, you know, this is actually quite thick. And it's not really focusing on the upper part, but essentially, it's giving more strength on this part. However, if you notice this, here you have a stronger response for the upper part and a lesser response for this particular pattern, which is in sync with the type of filter which you have, right? So we learn these kind of filters in uh, deep learning so that we can extract different levels of information, right? It's, a, it's like if you talk in terms of software engineering, it's like saying we would like to have different level of abstraction in my software. And what that would mean is that for the end user, the user will only see what is required to be seen. 
So what it means from the perspective of computer vision is when you have an input image, one layer would simply extract information which is available to it from the earlier layer. And that earlier layer could also be hiding some information from its next layer based on the processing which it has done from with the earlier layer. OK, now let's say you have this type of network. OK, so now what would happen is I would say in, in, in a classical sense, what we'll do is we will have a series of similar layers here. OK, we will have more layers here, which would be, you know, let's say an output of a filter which is being applied onto you know, this particular whole activation map. And similarly, there would be another layer. Oops. Uh, Hang on. <laughs> yeah, OK. So sorry. Oops. I think the PowerPoint just crashed at my end. I'll just open the window again. <laughs> just a moment. Sorry about that. That's the unexpected error from PowerPoint. Let me just go back and open it. So just okay, let's go to the slide here where I was. OK, so as I was saying, we can have a series of layers afterwards. And that would extract the information from the earlier layer. And it would finally lead us to a goal. For example, as I was saying earlier, the goal of the system can be to learn if there is a building or there is a person in the image. Now, the same concept of convolution neural networks, it got even upgraded with this step. So let me ask you guys a question. Can anyone tell me who are the people in these images? Can anyone recognize these uh, people? I'm just moving to the chat uh, window. So can anyone recognize who are these celebrities? Okay, I, let me check if I have a response in the chat window. Okay, um, someone is saying, well, this person looks like Beyonce. Okay, anyone else, guys? Does anyone recognize these people? Who are these people? No, okay, so, well, the reason we find it so difficult to find who these people are is simply because these people do not exist in the real world. So these are the images which have been generated by a network called Generative Adversarial Learning Network, GANs. So GAN, again, is based on the discussion which we just have. Of course, I gave a very simplified representation of a convolution neural network, what it could be. But for those who would be interested in learning the details of you know, uh, convolution neural networks and GAN, uh, they can refer to the deep learning book by Ian Goodfellow and others. That's a really good starting point. So coming to this, so as I was saying, well, these are fake images which have been generated by a network called GAN. And let's see what a GAN network is, OK? Now, in the case of a GAN, we have a network. Now, you can think of it as a convolution neural network. Okay. So this is a convolution neural network. The only difference is that the end of this network doesn't have any labels. It would actually be generating an image. Okay. So this network takes into input a random noise Z from a distribution, and it would then be generating an input, uh, an output image. And the task is to generate high quality outputs which would be mimicking how the training samples are. Okay, So that's your network number one. Now, we have another network, which is called your discriminated network. What your discriminated network does is it takes into input the image which is generated by the generator network, this part. And it also has access to the real images, which the generator network was supposed to generate. Okay, And then it would tell if the 
image which has been generated by the generator network if that is a real or if it is a fake now the we have two networks here the first is generator network the other is a discriminator network okay now the the task of the generator network is during the training it should become so good that the image which the generator network should generate that should be of a high quality such that the discriminator network tells that the input image is real, even though it is not real. Okay, So it is trying to fool a discriminator. Now, during the training for the discriminator, the task is that it has to learn so well that it should be able to distinguish between if the input image is real or it is an image which has been generated from a generator. Okay, Now, for these two networks, we have uh, what we call a min-max game, which is being played to train this. And essentially, the objective function is as follows. Let's say D is the discriminator and G is the generator. Okay, So we would like to maximize the objective for the discriminator, wherein we would like that the D of x, that is the input which D discriminator would get, which is the image, should be close to 1 for real. And for the D, the input which is the output of the generator G based on this uh, random noise input that should be close to zero. Okay. On the other hand, the generator would like to minimize the objective function, which would be that it would like the discriminator to be outputting close to one for the input, which is generated by the generator. So essentially it would try to make high quality images. Okay. Now this min max training that keeps on going in till we need what we call a uh, Point, which is called the Nash equilibrium. And of course, training GANs is a, is a non-trivial problem. There have been some seminal works by researchers in the past five years on around how we can better train these kind of networks so that we can achieve high quality images as I showed earlier. Okay. Now here's another output, guys. I'll play the video here. Hello, I'm Abhinav, and I'm going to present our work, Not Made for Each Other deep fake detection based on audio visual dissonance and this is a joint work with komal chuk parul gupta and ramanathan subramanian now if you notice here well you know you would have recognized that was me speaking it but if you notice closely you'll see that the lip movement was as if tom hanks was speaking it right so this is actually an output of a generative adversarial network based technique for generating a deep fake video. So here the identity is that of Tom Hanks. The words, the speech is mine and the facial movement is actually based on a video of mine. So there are two inputs. So an image of Tom Hanks and a video of mine. And we are trying to generate a video like this for the deep fake of Tom Hanks. OK, now what I would discuss now is how can we figure out if a video is deep fake or not? OK, and in this particular context, we are going to discuss about a sample which has not just the video, but the audio component as well, as you saw in the earlier slide. OK, now here's another one uh, which I would like you to see. Again, this is coming from, uh, you know, one of my favorite movies, Matrix, and it has been, uh, you know, manipulated. And let's see what it is. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon. Now here is the issue, right? You see that uh, again, you know, the real electric Keanu Reeves has been edited out. And let's say someone was watching this for the first time. And clearly you can see that this is a very high quality manipulation. So the person who has not seen this movie earlier would assume that this is the real actor, right? And that is how the misinformation can, can spread. So the cost of deep fakes is pretty high. People who have some adversarial motives, they could actually run campaigns, misinformation campaigns on social media based on these fake manipulated videos. Further, we can have you know, political turmoil. It's possible that you know, elections are approaching, for example, in the United States, you know, one could actually manipulate a video and have it for one of the, uh, you know, important political figure. And that would actually create a lot of noise, right? Even though it, if a video is figured out to be fake later on, but it would have done some damage already. And further, it has also been noticed that, you know, uh, since these generative adversarial network techniques are now available uh, online, as in you can have 
pre-trained models for these uh, some people are using these techniques to troll online so they will actually create fake videos of other and which is actually really disturbing further if these methods are getting better and better right the deep learning methods are getting better and better with time this can lead to you know a loss of faith in the media so how do we know if the video is real or not how do we know that if someone let's say a speech by a big person that is actually not being manipulated when i come across it on twitter or on uh, or facebook right so it is important to be able to come up with methods which can take care of the fix essentially validate a video and say if that video has been manipulated or not so here are some prior interesting works in this area by uh, some researchers so the early work was focusing on figuring out if there are some visual artifacts in the video so the hypothesis around these work for example the one by mathern and others is well when we have manipulation done to a video it's possible that sometimes the color of the two eyes that could be different in few frames so they actually analyzed the eyes area and the mouth area and they found that you know when people are speaking and it's a real video you'll see that there is a natural transition which is happening right natural transition from frame to frame in the texture information however in the case of fake videos we'll see that there is some kind of abnormality irregularity in the mouth region as well and we could train a convolution neural network to predict that if this particular sample if this particular data is manipulated or not further yang and others they looked at the head pose inconsistencies what that means is let's say if there is a manipulation which has been done to a video then when i would let's say be moving my head okay if this is a real video and if someone wants to manipulate this video then the head pose movement that would also have an irregularity that would have let's say some peaks which should not be there because usually our head pose movement is quite smooth right so uh, one can learn uh, a a method on top of the head pose movement then further lee and others they analyzed that the blinking pattern also is affected in case of a manipulated video so if it's a fake video then the blinking could be irregular and that can be an input to a network to find out if a particular video is manipulated or not further Lee and others also proposed a really interesting work. They said, well, you know, when you have a real video, then the manipulation which is done to the video can lead to certain artifacts to the video, which would be similar to as if we had some noisy information while morphing one face on top of the other face. So when we are doing morphing, we need to, let's say this is phase one and this is phase two. We need to know, let's say this is this, a particular point, let's say this was the nose, this is the other nose. We need to know where these points are and that, that's only I can morph one on the top of other, right? But if this process has some noise, then the morphing will be incorrect. So they actually use this information to generate fake data and then they learn, uh, you know, standard architecture such as the ResNet architecture and they found that this can be really useful in figuring out if, you know, some manipulation has been done. Further, there are other works, uh, by Newgen and others using the capsule networks uh, for fake detection, then uh, for looking at videos, uh, Sabir and others, they propose use of uh, recurrent neural networks, and they also found that you know, RNNs are quite useful uh, for the task of detection of fake. Now, let's look at our method, okay? So the hypothesis are behind our method is that if there is any manipulation done to the audio or the visual signal of a video, then this will lead to a disharmony, a dissonance between these two modalities, modalities audio or video. So basically, if a manipulation is done to either of these, it is possible that their belongingness to each other, corresponding audio and video, they will not belong as much as they would be if there was no change which was done. And this would, can be observed in terms of the loss of lip sync one could observe unnatural facial and lip movement okay so that's our hypothesis so that the method should be able to analyze if there is some disharmony between audio and video now this is inspired by the work of grimes and others from 91 so grimes and others did a really interesting experiment so they had tv advertisements so this is not computer science they had tv advertisements and they 
did these kind of experiments where they actually changed the sync between the audio and video. And then they found out that you know if there is a particular change which is observed, that the user will focus on that particular thing, right? So it's the same. We actually learn from it, and we say, well, you know, if either of audio or video have been manipulated, then we will see that there is a disharmony which comes into the audio visual pair at a point in the video. So here is the pipeline for our network. Let's say we have an input video of this subject, okay, and on the bottom is the corresponding audio part of that subject. What we do is we divide this video into segments. So let's say the segment one, segment two, to segment n, and similarly, same duration segment for audio as well. So audio segment one is the audio for the video segment one, and similarly for and these as well. From the video part, we do face detection, that is, detect where the face is, and then we have this network which is actually uh, having spatial temporal filters. So we have the spatial temporal convolution filters, and then we map that to a fully connected layer. On the bottom, from the audio segments, I you know, extract the MFCC features. And these are then input into a similar uh, convolution network. We have fully connected layers. And when we reach the fully connected layer 8, FC 8, we have a contrastive loss, okay? comparison loss here. And then we also added two you know, classification losses to the visual and the audio channel separately. Now, look, let's look at the training strategy. We have an input video. We divide that into segments of these seconds each. And similarly, we have the corresponding audio segments of the audio stream. The first one is the contrastive loss, which is based on computing the dissimilarity score. Now, the dissimilarity is here is the weights which we have from the fully connected layer of the video and the audio signal. And then we are trying to maximize the margin from, let's say, having a positive sample. So the positive sample has to be closer to another positive sample and has to be further away from a negative sample. Now, on top of this contrastive loss, we also add the cross entropy losses, which is the classification loss for the visual channel. That is when you only have the information from the fully connected layers coming in from the visual segments. And also, similarly, another loss for the audio segment as well. So that means we have three loss functions uh, for training of a network. And during the test inference, we again divide uh, incoming video into visual and uh, video and audio segments. And what we do is we compute a dissimilarity score between the corresponding audio and video segments. OK, so that here is the dissimilarity score. And then what we will simply do is we'll compute a modality dissonance score which is based on the individual dissimilarity scores of the segment. And then a video would be marked as fake if the MDS, the modality dissonance score, is more than a certain threshold. If it is less, then it will be a real video. Okay. So now let's look at the data in our experiments. The first one is the DFDC data set, which was hosted as a Kaggle challenge. It has 100K videos of 3,000 actors. In our experiments, we used 18K videos so as to have a fair comparison with the earlier works. And here, the data has been manipulated with different techniques. Okay. The second one is called the Deep Fake Timid data set, which is a subset of an earlier, uh, older data set called Big Timid. And here, the data has been manipulated using a generative adversarial network. And there are two configurations. So there's a high quality set of Deep Fake Timid, and there's a low quality set of Deep Fake Timid. So in order to fi fix the parameters and the structure of our network, we did several ablation studies. Okay, So here is the first study where we are looking at what is the contribution of different loss functions. Okay, So on the left is the plot for the combined, combined loss function. That is when we have the contrastive loss. And we have the two cross entropy loss added to the contrastive loss. And on the right, we only have the plot for the contrastive loss. The x-axis is the modality dissonance score. That is the, the, the disharmony score for uh, audio and visual sample. And on the y-axis, I have the total percentage of videos which had a particular MDS. Okay. Now, when we look at the combined loss used, then we see that the overlap between the distribution of the real and the fake is less as compared to the overlap between the real and fake for when only using the contrastive loss. 
what this tells us is that when we add the cross entropy, the classification loss to the audio and visual streams separately, that increases the discriminative ability of the network. And that is why we have a lower overlap. And this is what we want. If we have a lower overlap, then we can actually say, OK, higher dissonance score means video has been manipulated. Lower dissonance score means the video has not been manipulated. Further, we also did another study where we looked at the unimodal distances between the real and fake samples. So we have the real video of an actor and a manipulated video of the same actor. We compute the difference between them. And when we look at the difference between them by using L2, we see that the percentage of videos, you know, the percentage of pairs of these real and fake videos, there the distance is actually still narrowed around zero. So there's no not much difference in the case of audio stream. But on the other hand, for the visual stream, for the video data, the, we have a nice spread. OK, so what it means is that the data which we are using in our experiments, that actually is done, uh, has manipulation done to the visual part, not the audio part. You know, The audio manipulation is quite less. As you can see, that the difference between the real and fake of the same subject, that's quite narrow. Here, it's quite wide. Now, Here's a small subset of the experiments. So uh, the last column is the result of our method based on video level area under curve. And here we have other techniques, three other uh, you know, seminal works which have been done for defect detection. Row wise, we are showing the DFTC data set. And here we have the low quality and the high quality protocols of the DFTIM data set. So for first for the DFDC data set, we see that our method actually outperforms the state of the earlier state of the art method by close to 7%. And on the smaller DFTI map data set, our performance is comparable to that of the earlier works, but the earlier works clearly outperform everything else. They are actually quite saturated as well. And when we see that, you know, we see this uh, difference of two between R and theirs, essentially what we found out that the test set is so small that even misclassification of a single sample would lead to a large penalty. So uh, that actually would affect. Now, here is an output of a fake video. Okay, so. On the right, we are plotting the segment level dissimilarity score. And let's see how it plays. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right. So, for, so here, the video of President Obama has been manipulated. And you can see that the dissimilarity between the audio and visual corresponding chunks, that is quite high, right? So high value here means that there is manipulation which has been done on the video. Now, let's compare this with another video of President Obama, which has not been edited. So this is a real video. There's no manipulation done to the video. Hi, everybody. Anaya, thank you for that beautiful introduction. I could not be prouder of everything you've done in your time with the Obama Foundation. And of course, I couldn't be prouder of. So here you see that the, the dissonance score, the dissimilarity is quite low for audiovisual corresponding chunks as compared to you know, what we had for the fake video. And this tells us that you know this is actually a not manipulated video. Now, further, what we also did is so task one can be detecting if a video is manipulated or not. We can actually go to the next level where we can ask ourselves the question that, OK, if a video is manipulated, then where has the manipulation occurred in time? What are the timestamps where it has happened? OK, so since in our approach, we are dividing our video into segments, so we can actually have at least segment level scores. And that can tell us if the video has been manipulated in full. That is the whole duration of the video is manipulated, or only a part of it is manipulated. Now consider why this is very important. Let's say there is a video KYC of a person. And in that, the person is supposed to read out something. Okay, The person is supposed to read out. Uh, the question on the screen is, the question is read out, OK, uh, were you born before 1990? OK, let's say that's a question in a video KYC, you know, the know your customer. If the input was originally the person was supposed to say yes, 
but only that part of the video was manipulated where the person's you know facial motion was changed to show as if the person said no and the audio was also manipulated then we'll have a long video kyc but only a small part which could be manipulated and it could have very serious repercussions right so here what we see is we know to, to simulate these experiments we since we have the real and the video, manipulated video of the same subject we mix the segments so for example for this subject you see here that the real and the fake videos have been mixed so the early hair part is the real then there are some few fake segments of the same person then there is the real and similarly here the first half is real and the later half is fake so when you look at the y-axis so the the same dissimilarity score we see that you know for the real part we see that well you know this the dissimilarity is low but for the fake part we see that dissimilarity is high right so you can actually curtail this and say okay well this is the part where the manipulation has been done okay this in time and similarly for this this subject uh, since you observe that the dissimilarity is high here after this particular point you can say okay the later half of the video is modified the first half is real okay uh, let me show you an output of a video and as we plot this so here is a video let me play this Person, so I don't need anybody to me. I'm a little bit of an overachiever, so I get work in. But for my daughter, I don't think that. Uh... So on the x-axis is the ground truth. That is, in reality, these segments are real. This is fake. This is real. And you see, this is the output of our algorithm. You know, for a considerable good part, it's able to tell that okay, this is the part which is manipulated, right? So that's the localization output. So here's the conclusion of this particular detection work that you know uh, if the sample which we have input sample if it is audio visual then we can analyze the disharmony between the audio and visual segment to tell if a video is manipulated or not and further since we are dividing a video into chunks we can easily predict that if the timestamp which we are considering that one is manipulated or not so we can do localization so there are some really interesting directions which we can take from this one direction is human machine symbiosis. What that means is as the manipulation techniques will become better and better in future, right? With the progress in AI, the manipulation techniques will get better. What we should do is we should have a, a human in the loop, essentially both the human being and the, the, basically the user and the machine should decide if a video is fake or not. So what we can do for that is I'll show you one recent work which we uh, are you know having in a conference call ACM International Conference on Multimodal Interaction, where what we did is we did a study where we showed real and fake videos to to users and we recorded their eye gaze, eye gazes, so to tell where is a person looking on the screen. Okay, and we found a really interesting observation. So this is a real video, and here is the manipulated video of the same subject. Okay. On the top are is the input with, uh, video. On the bottom is something called saliency. Saliency is you know this heat maps. This tells us where is a user looking when they watch this video. Okay. Now, if you notice this, this real video, I'll play this real video. So you notice that the subject, you know, in the study, they noticed mainly this part. Okay. But they were also looking at this part as well. You know, they were exploring the area here. Something is there in the background. You see some motion is happening. There is a person here who's moving something. So that means it was taking their attention as well. So what we can say is that in the case of a real video where no manipulation has happened, the eye gaze behavior of a person is exploratory. They're exploring the scene around. Now, on the same side, if I look at the manipulated video of this subject let me pause this and let's look at this so this is a manipulated video and let's look at the eye gaze fixation so we see that here even though there is some movement happening here okay so there's someone who's talking you'll see that the majority of the fixation is happening on the person okay so what that means is as a user if you are walk, looking at a video and at a subtle we see a subtle discrepancy we observe that there's something odd about the video, then we will be fixating on that part. Okay. That would mean that we would actually having a more explanatory gaze. We're looking for an explanation why this particular video, why the face, let's say, of a person looks a bit different, uh, uh, you know, a bit away from the normal. Okay. So, what this means is that 
In future, we could have the task of defect detection as a combination of signals, uh, implicit signals from the user. So now I guess it is an implicit signal which we can get from the user and an AI based technique like the one which I discussed earlier. So together we can use this to actually predict if a video is fake or not. Now, other directions could be that we could use a weekly labeled learning based approach. What that means is that if I know that in my, during my training, if a video is edited, then I would assign that same manipulated fake label to very small, sh short duration segments of that video. And that can lead to uh, you know, better learning if we were using a framework such as the multiple instance learning. Further, you know, uh, there's scope to explore different multi-model fusion strategies, you know, how to combine audio, visual, and the human feedback. And there's another direction which we need to look at is since you know different data sets use different techniques of manipulation, we need to do cross data set analysis. That is, we train our method on one and then we test on the other data set. And then we see how generalized our method is, and that could be actually practically used in a real world scenario. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to move to the chat view, the Google Meet view, and uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions. So you can type in. Uh, the questions, or you can ask for uh, you using your microphone as well. If you have any questions or comments, uh, yes, Doctor Abhinav. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you hear me? I would like to invite participants for the queries. Please share your queries in the chat box. Uh, Professor Ravneet, if you can read some of the uh, queries already in the chat box. Uh, sorry, yet. Someone was asking about the presentation that is, uh, it is going to be shared after webinar. Uh, sir, one, one question is uh, Prabhdeep Singh has asked how we can use it in cybersecurity. Right, that, that, that's a good question. So, uh, deep fake videos is a major part of deep news manipulation, right? So, fake news. So, in the case of cybersecurity, there are different facets. I'll take one example. So, the video KYC example which I was giving, right? So, video know your customer example. In, in, in that case, if instead of the real person, let's say I was going to open an account with, uh, you know, a bank or any online uh, service such as uh, ATM or any other service. Now, instead of having the real person, if I can have a manipulated video of that person, right, then I can actually trick the system. So we need these kind of solutions which can tell that if it is really the real person. So you can actually do a lot of things. I showed a fun example. Let me go back to the slides that I was showing. Uh, Tom Hanks speaking about the paper, right? This one. So if, if you notice, let, I'll play it again and just uh, and then let's try to imagine together the repercussions of such a video. Hello, I'm Abhinav. I'm going to present our work, not made for each other. This is Dustin, based on audio visual documents. So now. We can have any of this type of manipulation and it can have different repercussions. It could be, let's say, someone you know, uh, answering a question on someone's behalf. It could be, let's say, during an exam, someone impersonating someone else, or you know, even during authentication, let's say, mobile phone authentication, system authentication. So, these states is now a big challenge, especially when it comes to fake news or you know, uh, some uh, unethical authentication system. So here is another question from uh, Amritant. Uh, do you think that in the future we will ever reach a point where it's impossible to detect a deep state? Well, that's a good question. So, um, okay. So that's the reason I said that you know we need human machine symbiosis. Let me give you uh, a use case. 
So let's say uh, a teacher is presenting a class online on Zoom or on Google Meet, and he or she conducts an, a quiz. Okay, when they conduct a quiz, let's say there was already a feature like this which was there, with which they could analyze if you know it's the real person in uh, their gallery view, or it's you know a manipulation uh, has been done to that video, or is it someone else who's impersonating? And when they use their software, if it, it gives them a high score of, you know, uh, this video is fake or a very confused score, let's say 25, not fake or not real, I'm not sure. Now, the human can come into the loop, right? How the human being can come into the loop that he or the instructor can ask an impromptu question. Now, when they will ask an impromptu question, if, if it has an element of surprise, then real person will actually show a if they're engaged, they will show a different reaction, which would be difficult for a deep fake method to generate in real time. So that can be used again by the system to detect if there is some manipulation happening or not. And and, and there are a lot more uh, techniques, it's not as simple. See, what, what happens is, uh, right now we are only looking at the facial movements in deep fakes, but tomorrow facial movements will be combined with microphones as well sorry with uh, the hand gestures as well right so as you see me now as i'm talking i'm also using hand movement okay so this hand movement will also have a different pattern so as the techniques will progress our methods will also progress i can draw probably to virus and antivirus viruses are improving so our antivirus systems they are improving so this will be like a you know a cat and a mouse game So we have another question. Uh, Prabhdeep Singh, sir, want to, uh, okay, Prabhdeep, you want to ask? You can turn on your mic. Good morning, sir and ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, please ask your question. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, sorry. Uh, actually, I want to ask, uh, like every virus or a bug has a signature, according to which an antivirus uh, detects, detects a virus. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, if we edit a video, does the neural networks have some signature so we can use it as a data set and uh, use it in our program uh, to detect its deep fake? That's an excellent question, Prabhupada. So, if you notice, uh, I was mentioning that earlier technique for deep fake detection, they work on the, the hypothesis that there would be some visual artifact which will be generated when manipulation has occurred. For example, it's possible that when you observe the mouth part of a video, right? This video, for I'll just switch off the audio for this, and let me just say, right? Just look at the mouth part. If you notice closely, there are some artifacts which are there, right? So these kind of signatures would be there by deep fake techniques. Now, there's another term which has been introduced, it's called speed fakes, that is, you know, methods which are not really as high quality. So, uh, in the future, yes, it would be uh, get, getting a bit difficult, but you raise a very interesting point, right, the signature part. So, one direction is that then tomorrow, let's say someone will post a real video online, they would also be using some verification signatures. So these verification signatures could be person specific as well, right? So let's say uh, uh, your system learns your facial movements and it adds a signature which is only replicable for your facial movements. Okay, right? as of now, most of the techniques are generic that they are trained on a group of people's data. So if it is on just okay. one person, it would be, you know, uh, more uh, accurate. But yeah, we can add, you know, these kind of signatures both for making sure that a video is having a, uh, you know, uh, a tag, I would say, of fake or real, and also the similar type of signatures which are in terms of artifacts, which are added to by a uh, manipulation method. Okay, thank you. So here, there's another question. Um, so Kristen is asking, can generative adversary networks we used to generate something other than images for something really useful. Okay, so uh, there are two parts to the question. 
I would actually answer the second part first for something very useful. I would say, well, generative adversarial networks are being used already for creating new images which are meaningful. For example, we can actually use generative adversarial networks to add variations to already existing medical data. See, medical data, for example, from CT scanners, from MRIs, from ultrasound scanners, right? That is difficult to get. So with generative adversarial network, we can generate useful data for creating a larger data set for learning a system which could tomorrow uh, detect a particular abnormality, a particular disease in, uh, uh, you know, let's say an ultrasound or a CT scan. So it's really useful. And also, you know, uh, it's been used for uh, generating data for self-driving cars. So I, I, it's really useful. Well, coming to the first part now, for, for something other than images, of course, you can use generative adversarial networks for text. You can generate text. You can generate audio. And given the right type of data and the right structure of the network, one could also generate physiological signals. What that would mean is, let's say, given an input video, we can generate the heart rate. So there are a lot of possibilities. So we can go to the other question. If there is any other. Uh, so there is one more question from Amritaj Kaur Mamutra. Uh, do you think that in the future we will ever reach a point where it will be impossible to detect a deep fake? Yeah, so actually, uh, yeah, I think I, I partly answered that. So the techniques will improve, yes. So it's possible that for a novice, for a common user, uh, it, it could get difficult to detect if a video is manipulated or not. But to an expert, now that expert would be a combination of a person, let's say, who is in a verification team in a big company and his or her AI tool, the deep fake detection tool, to find out you know, if that video is uh, real or it has been manipulated. So it's kind of the same, right? It's possible that some computers may have a virus or a backdoor entry in the software, but a common user never realizes it. It's only when some experts would do testing of a system or software, they will realize that there are some, let's say, backdoor entries or there are some, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of some type of hacking, right? So in the future, yes, methods will improve. The system would uh, then be able to recognize in sync with an expert. Maybe common people, they may not. So it's possible that, yes, we may miss, uh, you know, uh, sometimes that if it's a real video or a fake video. And that's why it, this is so dangerous. OK, do we have any other question? Uh, I think there are no more questions in the chat box. Uh, Professor Runeet, uh, you can continue. Their voice is not coming. Voice is not audible. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is it audible, sir? It's audible now. OK. Thank you, sir, for sharing the valuable information on deep fakes detection. I hope now all the participants will take an open and collaborative initiative for the creation of innovative new technologies to detect deep fakes and manipulated media. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Baljeet Singh Khaira, sir, professor in CSC department, to deliver a vote of thanks. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, respected Dr. Abhinamital, lecturer at Field of Information and Technology and leading the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Lab, Monash University, Australia. Dr. G. S. Lamba, Principal, Baba Bandha Singh Bahadur Engineering College, Fatehgarh Sahib. Dr. Kanwar Veer Singh Pinsa, Head, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Professor Ramneet Kaur, law coordinator, ACM student chapter, and dear participants. Good afternoon to all of you. Myself, Dr. Baljeet Singh Khaira, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, 
ਬਾਬਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਇੰਜੀਨੀਅਰਿੰਗ ਕਾਲਜ ਫਤਿਹਗੜ੍ਹ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਔਨ ਦਾ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਆਫ ਕੰਪਿਊਟਰ ਸਾਇੰਸ ਐਂਡ ਇੰਜੀਨੀਅਰਿੰਗ ਡਿਪਾਰਟਮੈਂਟ ਐਂਡ ਏਸੀਐਮ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਚੈਪਟਰ ਬਾਬਾ ਬੰਦਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਇੰਜੀਨੀਅਰਿੰਗ ਕਾਲਜ ਫਤਿਹਗੜ੍ਹ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਆਈ ਐਕਸਪ੍ਰੈਸ ਮਾਈ ਗ੍ਰੈਟੀਟਿਊਡ ਟੂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਤਾਲ ਫਾਰ ਐਕਸੈਪਟਿੰਗ ਆਰ ਰਿਕਵੈਸਟ ਟੂ ਡਿਲੀਵਰ ਦਾ ਸਪੋਰਟ ਆਫ ਔਨ ਦਾ ਟੌਪਿਕ ਰਿਸਰਚ ਐਂਡ ਐਡਵਾਂਸਸ ਇਨ ਡੀ ਫੇਕ ਡਿਟੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਤਾਲ ਥੋਰਲੀ ਡਿਸਕਸਡ ਵੇਰੀਅਸ ਅਪਰੋਚਸ used to create deep fakes and more importantly methods proposed to detect deep fakes dr tal also discussed research trends and future directions related to the deep fake technology dr tal provide a comprehensive overview of deep fake techniques and fully states the development of new and more robust methods to deal with the increasingly changing for the detection of deep fakes i thank dr tal for his excellent expert work he delivered today through the online mode and providing huge amount of knowledge related to deep fake research field I am very thankful to all the participants and organizers for organizing wonderful webinar during this tough time. I am confident this talk will be very beneficial for us, for our society and for our nation. Thank you all very much. Stay safe. Wish you and your family good health. Thank you, Dr. Shuran. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Prabhdeep uh, Singh uh, to ask the question. You are having some query. Please ask the question. Either you can type or you can unmute your mic. Yes, please. Uh, Ma'am, uh, sir, actually I have a question. Uh, if someone defakes my voice or my face, uh, I don't think uh, it's any of you. Uh, no one is going to believe or there is no... Uh, nothing going to be impact on the society unless i am a public figure okay. so my question is ke agar koi mere uh, public figure ka main to karega agar koi jaise sharukh khan agar isne ya kisi politician ka public uh, deep fake hota hai iska koi impact hoga agar koi mera deep fake karta hai to it's of no use well i, I disagree Uh, Prabhupada, so uh, if, you, if you recall, I was mentioning that the issue with deep fake is trolling, right? So currently, trolling is happening by some people creating fake videos of normal people as well. So uh, even if let's say someone is not a public figure, not a politician or an actor, even then, depending on what type of fake video it is, it can have a lot of repercussions for that person in their personal life so right now the majority of the deep fake unfortunately is actually in is being used in creating porn, fake porn videos and uh, you know it's no brainer it, it will affect anyone so i would say you know it, it's also for uh, end users and consumers as well to yes. have you know, these kind of techniques for detection of manipulation of video of video thank you thank you uh, dear participants the link for feedback is available in the chat box kindly fill the feedback lo- uh, feedback form and the e certificates will be awarded to only those participants who will submit a feedback form so kindly please fill the feedback form uh thank you dr tal for uh, such an enlightening talk we'll remain in touch in the future also and uh, thanks once again thank you thank you all right please, please, thank please. you sir thank you dr dal thank you dr dean sir thank you bye thank you all right bye thank you participants okay have a nice day